So we're reading from Isaiah 49, uh, verses 14 to 18, and then we're jumping to Isaiah chapter 50. So that's page 36, 736, Isaiah 49, starting at verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she is born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Your children hasten back and those who laid you waste depart from you. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will wear them all as ornaments. You will put them on like a bride. Let me go into chapter 50. This is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins you were sold. Because of your transgressions your mother was sent away. When I came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Was my arm too short to deliver you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? By a mere rebuke, I dry up the sea. I turn rivers into a desert. Their fish rot for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with darkness and make sackcloth its covering. The Sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. But now all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go, walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And Pam, thank you for reading it to us. Friends, please keep open page 736, 737 in front of you. I would just really want you to see uh, as well as hear what the Lord is saying to us this morning. So let's pray as well together. Um, Lord, we've already sung about your majestic love and authority revealed in your word and how the gospel is our greatest joy and our deepest need. Uh, and so in these moments, please, would you, would you speak love, authority, power, joy, which meets our deepest needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, when I was working as a school teacher, the commute was about a 30 minute drive. I usually did that alone. Uh, and one morning I was driving to work about halfway, 15 minutes into the journey, when my colleague rang me. He lived not too far from me down the road. Uh, he rang me and said, um, you promised to pick me up this morning, Tim. Have you forgotten me? And I had, I'd forgotten. I can sure you can imagine how he felt in that situation, the sense of feeling forgotten, ignored, overlooked. It's dreadful, isn't it? Whether it's the friend who fails to show, like I did, or the call which never comes, 
or the person who actually is in the same room as you but no longer seems interested in the way they once were. The feeling of being forgotten it cuts to the heart. It's hard to put into words. And I just wonder this morning if any of us are feeling that way about God himself, perhaps in our own personal circumstances for whatever reason, or together in, as this church in a country where Christian faith is evaporating, Christian values are, and teaching are evaporating like the early morning dew in the sunshine, we might be thinking, the Lord has forgotten me, us. Does that sound familiar at all, perhaps, to some of us? It might be your experience this morning that you're thinking, well, never, got, never mind God forgetting me, he's never shown up in the first place. He's not there. Or at least if he is there, he's by no means interested in me. Well, those are the feelings our passage of Scripture grapples with today. God speaks to uh, his people back in about 600 BC through the prophet Isaiah. And did you see verse 14, top of page 736, right-hand column? Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And notice who's speaking, it's Zion, the code name for Jerusalem, God's chosen people, his beloved city. En masse, they were all thinking, he's forgotten us. And if we cast our minds back to the last few weeks, then we know that they were feeling that because what Jerusalem was, surrounded, defeated, taken off as captives to that ancient superpower, Babylon. And there in Babylon, the people would look around and say, the Lord's forgotten us. But Isaiah's message is not finished. We've got today's sermon and three more in the coming weeks to go to grasp fully the message of hope and comfort and joy God has for his people. Do you remember it was some time ago, back in chapter 40, just after Easter, we heard the opening words of chapter 40 of Isaiah. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. And then look down last week, the last verse of last week, verse 13, at the bottom of the left-hand page. The Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. The Lord has a message of comfort for us to hear. And this morning, into that sense of being forgotten, God, God offers us two answers and one solution. I want us to take a look at those together for a few moments. Here's his first answer when people say the Lord has forgotten me. I will not forget you. Look down. Well, we'll look down in a second. Uh, just six years ago now, our first child, Mia, was born. And I have to say, I was totally unprepared for how consumed by concern I would be for this little new life in our household. It was the middle of a heat wave, so I was concerned for, was she feeding enough? Was she sleeping enough? Did she have a nappy need changing? Was her temperature okay? It was really hot. Um, I'm going to embarrass her, but I have to say, my concern for Mia was nothing compared to the devoted concern of Abby, her mum. And look how the Lord comforts his people. Verse 15. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? and have no compassion on the child she's born, though she may forget, I will not forget you. The Lord God is far more concerned than the most devoted mother to his child, and far, far more concerned than a neglectful mother towards his people. I will not forget you. He's not forgotten us. Verse 16, see, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Ever taken a biro and written a note to yourself on your hand? If you do that, it's because you're, you always see your hands. It, it brings it to mind. Every time you look down, you see what you wanted to be reminded of. Well, if I can say it this way, the Lord is telling us he has tattooed your name, my name, onto his hands, engraved so that he is ever mindful of us. He does not forget us. And the Lord wants us to take those pictures to heart this morning. 
He says, I will not forget you. I'm ever mindful of you. You're closer to my heart than a baby on its mother's breast. Those are the words of comfort to hear, not just for a seasoned Christian amongst us, but for anyone among us here this morning who will find hope in what God is saying. I will not forget you. Now, perhaps you're thinking, well, these words are just mere sentiments. You know, they're sort of warm and well-meaning, but they don't really speak of any action. Well, the Lord promised that his lack of forgetfulness would act. He would see his people gather to Zion once more. Verse 17, your sons hasten back. Those who laid you waste, Babylon, depart from you. Lift up your eyes, look around. All your sons gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will wear them all as ornaments. I guess many of us watched the TV coverage of the coronation recently for Charles and Camilla. Uh, and did you see the segments about the jewellery? You know, the gems on the crown, the gems in the necklace that was being worn. They spoke of great history. They spoke of relationships that the, the royal family had, generous gifts from other monarchs and things. Each jewel and gem spoke of history and of intense personal relationship. It had a real significance. And the Lord says to his city, the jewels in my crown, the crown and glory of my city will be the people I am gathering back to it. I know each of them by name. Children of mine, I have not forgotten you. But Jenny, but James, but Fred, but Maggie, but Shireen, but Harry, you will be my crowning joy in my city. You are that significant. No longer will you be captives, but gems, I will gather you home. And it's a gathering pictured in verse 22. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I'll beckon to the Gentiles, I'll lift up my banner to the peoples, and they will bring your sons in their arms and carry your nation, or daughters on their shoulders. God is not forgetting his people, but bringing them home from all nations, such that he can say, end of verse 23, look down at this, those who hope in me will not be disappointed. He's not forgetting his people. He's gathering them to himself. And if you sat here thinking, I'm just not sure the Lord is strong enough to be able to do that, to overcome all that stands against him, then verse 25, he says, yes, captives will be taken from warriors, plunder retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you your children, I will save. If we think the Lord forgets his people, he says, I will not forget. I will gather you home. I am strong enough to do it. And he did. The, book of, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are about the story of God bringing his people back to Jerusalem. But not just in that time. The Lord God today is still gathering people into his heavenly city, his eternal gathering, saved through the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord is doing that, beckoning in the nations. We may think that Christian faith is evaporating in this country, but in Nigeria and Sudan, Iran and North Korea, across the world, the gospel is blossoming, even in places where we might think people would say, this is too hard. The Lord has forgotten us. No, he does not forget. He gathers his people in. Right at the beginning of our time in Isaiah, I said that one great pillar, you know, great pillar that you build something on, a pillar of comfort in these chapters in Isaiah is God's glory, his character. He is the creator the maker, he is God and there is no other. He alone can mould and shape people and times and places and history to his purposes. And he says this morning, I will not forget you. I will gather my people. That is the first answer the Lord gives. 
But I have to say the second is much harder to listen to. And it's there in chapter 50. God also says to his people, you sinned against me. Chapter 50, verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins you were sold. Because of your transgressions your mother was sent away. Sometimes the truth really hurts, doesn't it? The Lord responds to his people in this time saying, I've not forgotten you. I've not divorced you. I've not sold you off because I was in debt. But you've sold out on me. You've walked out on our relationship. You are the one at fault. It was sin and transgression, which was why God's people were taken captive into Jerusalem. And those words sin and transgression, they have the sense of willful perversion. Willingly choosing to look for hope and comfort elsewhere other than the Lord God. Now let's be clear. If a relationship painfully breaks up between two humans today, it's not really on, is it? It's not really on for one of those people to say, look, I am perfect and flawless. This was all your fault and nothing of me whatsoever. You're the one who went wrong. In fact, sometimes that's the reason why relationships break up, because people can't see their own sin. Human life is much messier than that, but it's different between God and humans. He is the holy, perfect and flawless one. Back in chapter 43 in verse 3, he had said to his people, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. You are precious and honoured in my sight and I love you. Perfect, holy, wonderful love, pour, wonderful love poured forth from the Lord and was met with sin and transgression in his people. That was the reason they went into exile. It's not the Lord who forgets or changes. No, they went to, into Babylon captive forever because they'd sinned and rebelled against him, turned from him, walked out on him. And God was calling them to recognize and own up to that. Well, that was them. What about us. Please hear me carefully. It is not always the case in the Bible that when things get tricky or people feel forgotten, it's because we have sinned. Do not believe that lie. We just can't jump to that conclusion. We must not say to ourselves, it must be something I did. And yet in each dark valley, and some of us can testify to this, each spiritual low, each sense of feeling forgotten, it's an opportunity, isn't it, to turn afresh to the Lord, to remember who he is, to be gathered to him, to turn to the one who, who does not forget us, to call out to him and to confess our need for him, and maybe to recognise and admit that we have wandered from him. So perhaps we're in the midst of suffering. And what we really long for and ask for is the solution and the healing now. And we need to confess we've forgotten that the Lord says, well, following me is like taking up your cross and dying to self. Or maybe if God feels distant, we need to hear what he says in verse 2. When I came, why was there no one? God has come close and has come close to us in the person of Christ. Are we listening? Or are we distracted, looking elsewhere? Or if we feel captive, caught up in a sinful tendency which we could never leave behind or we think God would never break through or have us. Verse 2, we need to hear and be reminded that he says, Do I lack the strength to rescue you? No, not at all. You see, to the people at that time, God could clearly say, I have not forgotten you, but you have sinned against me. For us, the question is, 
as God says, I won't forget you, have you turned from or forgotten him? How have you turned from or forgotten him? How are you turning from or forgetting him? Just earlier in the service, we have confessed our own sin through our weakness, our negligence and our deliberate fault. Friends, the reality of Christian experience is that I wander each day and then I'm caught and reminded of how foolish that is and I'm drawn back to the Lord and then I wander again and then I repent of sin because it's so distressing and I'm assured of the gospel and brought back. It's foolish to say we don't wander. How is the Lord calling us to remember him afresh? You see, God's two answers to that accusation that he's forgotten us is that he's not forgotten, but we are quick to forget him. But that second pillar of comfort that I mentioned right at the beginning of the series is now the solution he offers to this problem. The second pillar we can build on in Isaiah 40 to 55, the solution is his servant. His servant who suddenly appears in chapter 50. Have you ever taken part in going around a maze and you've got really lost? You just can't get out or into the middle. And there's someone, you know, someone you know has got to the middle and they're shouting, come on, come on, it's not far, you can do it. It's just you think, well, I, I can't do it. I'm going around literally in circles. What I really need is you, you to come into the maze and hold my hand and get me to the middle, lead me there. All of a sudden, the servant pops up. Isaiah has been showing us that the people's problem is like trying to complete a maze in pitch black. The people are captive physically, foreigners in Babylon. They're captive spiritually, sinners and transgressors. And although, although God's words of comfort saying, I will not forget you, they are comforting. What you and I need is someone to lead us and come and take us by the hand. And into the darkness steps the servant to lead us home. The same one we were hearing about last week. You see, while God has told us there was no one when he came looking into his city, no one who followed him, no one righteous, not even one, all of a sudden, verse 4, who is this? The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. Here is light in the darkness, hope for those who feel forgotten. Here is a person who, as he wakes up at the beginning of each morning, he doesn't tune into the radio where he, feel, he, he hears chart-topping songs filled with angst and heartbreak. Nor does he wake up first thing and check his social media stream and just get deluged by the demands made there. What does he do? Verse 4. He wakens and listens to the word. And what does it do? The word of God sustains the weary. This servant is utterly different from all the Lord's people sent into exile because he is daily, moment by moment, close to his God. And he's not caught up in sin or rebellion. Verse 5. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I've not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. Here is someone who, even when God's sustaining words were challenging and hard to follow, he went through with them, although it was painful and costly. Does he sound familiar? Is this servant music to your ears? Is he balm to your soul? Is he good news for you this morning? Is he light in your darkness? Here is a servant who strangely would yet suffer, despite his obedience. Verse 6, he was beaten mocked, spat at, his beard was even pulled out. And yet even in the midst of suffering, he would say, verse seven, the sovereign Lord helps me. He has not forgotten me. The servant entrusted himself to the Lord even in the darkest of valleys, hundreds of years before Christ Jesus walked the earth. Isaiah is writing of him. The one who listened to the Lord God and never turned away. The one who suffered on our behalf, and we'll see more of that in Isaiah 53. The one who entrusted himself to the Lord and trusted the Lord would not forget him. The Lord Jesus. 
And perhaps you're wondering, well, didn't, didn't he forget the Lord on the cross? Didn't he cry out, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Well, that is so different from what the people said. The people in verse 14 where we began said, the Lord has forgotten me. Conclusion made. Jesus prayed. My God, my God, help, because it feels like I'm forgotten. Don't we need someone who can lead us in praying like that? In relating to the Lord, even in the darkest valley, he was talking to the one who he felt had forsaken him, as he bore all of the sin of the world on his shoulders, and yet he entrusted himself to the Lord. Friends, there is no one better qualified to lead us through the darkness of this world than Jesus Christ. He is the one who can lead us home to the Lord. No one better qualified. In fact, no one else can do it. And if you feel mild, mildly indifferent to him, or like he's let you down, or like he's permanently forgotten you, do not believe the lie. The Lord does not forget. Christ has come to take your hand and lead you home. So turn to him. Hold on to him. Follow his light. Be led by him. He is the solution the Lord God offers. The servant sent to lead us home. Do you see where our passage ends this morning? Down in verse 10. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the words of his servant? Who among you obeys and fears? You want close fellowship with the Lord? Hear his word. Obey it. Hang on it. If we try and light our own pathway, we'll only lead ourselves further into darkness, further away to God, further away from God, further away feeling like we've been forgotten, into torment and eventually into hell. But if we would be led by him, his light, the servant God sends, he will lead us home. We will find ourselves closer to God than a baby comforted at its mother's breast. And we will see his hands, which have our names all over them. Let's turn to him. Let's follow him. Let's be led by his light. Let's walk with him in his power for his glory. Amen.